How's it going, everybody? It is your favorite apostates again. My name, of course, is McKay. <laughs> My name is Jordan. I seriously, every single time I do this, <laughs> I mess up somehow, but I'm not going to redo it. So um, before we get started today, we're doing a little bit uh, different stuff. But before we get started, um, thanks to everybody who went over to our Etsy store, Happy Brain Collective, and uh, put an order in. We are freaking ecstatic over that um today we are waiting on some tissue paper to get delivered and then we will um, resume packing orders but uh yeah you guys are all awesome rocked it absolutely amazing thank you to each and every one of you that made a purchase it's nice to see designs sell after you put time into it (laughs) and this like the etsy shit is like 100 percent. that's jordan like for sure she does everything so i'm just over here like hey like what can i do to help whatever you help me pack orders i pack but like usually i'm she's already doing stuff when i come in the room and i'm like "Eh, what can i do so anyway let's get on with it today um today's gonna be a little bit different uh this is gonna be jordan's show today i asked her if she wanted to do it solo because that's on her if she wants to. Um, but she said she wanted me to be here, even though I'm just going to basically yield the time to her. I'm going to just edit the start and the end. But so long as there's no major like pauses or anything like that, I think basically everything from here on out is just going to be uh, uncut. So, yeah. Take it away, Jordan. I wanted it to be like more of an authentic experience. I didn't want you to feel like I was like, and you probably don't care, but I didn't want to be like editing things out or making things sound maybe better than they were. Yeah. Um, so that's why I didn't want to edit any of it. So this is raw footage. So yeah, (laughs) um, this is also going to be not your normal snarky us. Maybe some jokes may be made, but, uh, yeah, if you're looking for something, I have to laugh. Like our usual cry. stuff. Um, <laughs> this stuff is heavy. Along. So trigger warning for anybody who has, I mean, we're talking about, we'll talk about my pregnancy a little bit, um, my traumatic birth experience, and then my postpartum experience, which includes postpartum psychosis. Um, so if any of those things kind of might be triggersome to you, um, if you're dealing with infertility or if you have similar birth experiences um also if you don't like medical stuff i'm not gonna go like too deep on medical stuff um just i'll just give you like a basic overview there's nothing too i mean i guess it's a little bit gruesome but yeah if you don't like medical stuff or like that type of talk makes you kind of queasy um it might be best to skip this one yeah so The only reason really, well, there's two reasons that I'm doing this. The big reason that kind of pushed me to do this is because I've talked about my experience, my traumatic birth and my postpartum experience on Instagram a bit. Um, And every time I do, I get hundreds of DMs asking me um, if I'll share more, if I'll expand, if I'll, postpartum psychosis I think is like super intriguing to a lot of people because it doesn't really get talked about. So every time I brought it up on Instagram, I got hundreds of DMs. So I figured if I have this many people asking about it and there's a lot of stigma attached to mental health in general and especially to postpartum mental health um, for women, I figured this would be a good way to kind of bring light to something that isn't really talked about. Yeah. So, and I wanted McKay here with me because I feel like... It's one thing for me to talk about it, but he was also there for all of it. (laughs) (laughs) So it's nice to have like his perspective as well, because obviously things looked a lot different to me um, than they did to him. So, yeah. So I'll kind of go in chronological order and I want to kind of share once we get to the postpartum psychosis, I'll share a little bit about it, like medically what we know. So you have some solid information around it rather than just my experience. So 
McKay and I decided we wanted to have kids, and that was mainly a big push within Mormonism. Um, and so it was kind of abrupt. I was one day just like, hey, I'm ready to have kids. And McKay was like, okay. And then yeah, it was happening. <laughs> yeah. And to preface this, um, up until that point, let's see, we had been married two years at that point, almost two years mm-hmm. at that point. Um, we were dead set on not having any kids up until at least the five year mark. Yeah. Um, and we were like adamant that that's what the plan was. Um, and then as soon as Jordan said, it's time, I was like, yep. And I feel like I was kind of primed because that's what you do in Mormonism. And (laughs) we were a united front. So, um, I didn't want any contention and it's not to say that i feel coerced or anything like that and i'm very gr- glad that we have our son but i feel like our religiosity at the time definitely played into it i don't think we would have had an kids eternal family yeah. no i don't think um either and we obviously we do not regret having our son do no. i wish i had a little more brain development time before we had him yell yeah, jordan's bit. brain isn't even fully developed no, quite yet his brain is my Mine, brain is not yeah i'm, I'm already dying basically oh so. my gosh so we kind of jumped right in previous to deciding i had had surgery for my endometriosis which i was diagnosed with so i had excision excision uh excision oh my god excision excision surgery laparoscopic talk. excision surgery yeah like six months prior and not so, even not it even. was that was in july july and then in november you got pregnant so you were ready to get pregnant like in september yeah so it only been like two months basically so we didn't know we were gonna have kids at, like we were going to try at that point and my doctor was like you know right after this type of surgery it like jump starts your fertility basically so if that's something you're interested in just be mindful of that and so i think that is the only reason we got pregnant as fast as we did because i do have endometriosis and it is my endometriosis is awful and so I really thought we were going to struggle with infertility. And I think the only reason we didn't was because of that surgery. Yeah. So we jumped right in. I got pregnant, I think, month two. um, Yeah. Which was not expected. And so everything was dandy until about 12 weeks. 12 weeks. I was like. like, 12 weeks on the. On the day. Day. I was like, I don't have any symptoms. I feel great. Everything's awesome. Being pregnant's awesome. And then I got hit like a mother effing train with nausea. Holy shit. No joke. So I have like awful extensive emetophobia. And if you're not aware of what that is, it's a fear of vomiting. And so I've had this since I was a child. And I have no idea why I have this. But people like I can't. I am, I can't deal with people vomiting around me. I can't deal with myself. I can't like even pets puking around. Like I can't, I can't, I just can't deal with it. So that was my biggest fear getting pregnant. And so I told my OB this and my OB was like amazing. And so he put me on, he gave me anti-nausea pills before it even started just so I was prepared. Um, And they're the only reason I feel like I made it through my pregnancy because I would have oh, been for real. worse than I was if that was happening at the same time. Oh, yeah. And there was not a day that went by from week 12 until the day she popped our little boy out <laughs> um, that she wasn't nauseous, but she did not vomit a single time. So she kept that shit managed. I did. I like I was on anti-nausea pills like nobody's business. Like Zofran was my best friend yeah. all of my pregnancy so B, uh, what vitamin oh b6 B and, and uh, Unisom, Unisom. so i can sleep at night every single day so my whole pregnancy um i guess i have to like preface preface this with the fact that the more i look back on my pregnancy postpartum my birth experience, everything, the more I look back on it, I see the intersection of Mormonism through all of it and not in a good way. And so people are like, oh my God, you drag Mormonism into everything because it was such a huge part of our lives that it impacted us on literally a daily basis. So 
I was working for the church at the, at the time. time. Our insurance was provided by the church. church like time. literally everything had to do with the church. Yep. So I, when I first got pregnant, I would pray to Mormon God and say, I will like, I promise to raise my son in the church and do everything right. If you just <laughs> will make my pregnancy <laughs> easy and make me not puke. Okay. And so I, and I was on Zofran at the, like, all of my pregnancy, but I credited that to Mormon God because I had made this promise, right? Yep. And in Mormonism, they're, you're told that, you know, if you make a promise and you meet both ends of the bargain, like Heavenly Father, Mormon God will make up the rest, right? And so I frequently prayed to Mormon God about really specific things regarding my pregnancy. And so... My pregnancy on the whole was god awful. I had every symptom you could possibly think of. I had it in severity. I had like pelvic pain that was ungodly. I wasn't sleeping like at all. Um, I could only sleep during the day. I couldn't sleep at night. Um, yeah. Lightning crotch. Lightning crotch, yeah. which freaking suck. If you have endo, you probably know what that is. Yeah. Um, you couldn't, uh, I couldn't open the refrigerator door oh my God. because the smell, when we lived in a basement uh, apartment, apartment at the time, so the smell would linger, like even, I, had, I would, I, like, I'd get the baking soda and throw it in there, I would clean it out all the time, and even still, like, I couldn't even get some Those of you of that have fridge. been pregnant, you probably had superhuman smell, and it, yeah. it sounds like a great thing, but really it sucks. <laughs> oh, yeah. One day we had a... Um, we had there was a wood burning fireplace and i i was stoked over it and then uh a couple weeks after we had the fire was when jordan started having the smells and literally she could not sit in the living room because of the it fire smell so bad i would have to yeah. stay in our bedroom basically all the time because it smelled so bad so that was fun so yeah super human smell like any i got towards the end i got this really like it's I don't remember what it was called, but it was this itchy thing where your body just like basically starts itching oh, all over. Shit, I forgot about that. Um, so I had that. Um, like I was swollen my whole pregnancy. I like there wasn't a single part of me that wasn't swollen my whole pregnancy. Yeah. I gained eighty pounds with my son. So and that was. This still to this day is the heaviest I've ever been. You never, surprisingly, never was diabetic. No. While you were. I was really freaking concerned about it with all the weight I was gaining. Um, The funny thing is my OB never brought it up, which I think is kind of great. Great, honestly. (laughs) Because you can have. My own damn business, bro. You can have a healthy pregnancy while gaining that much weight. It's not ideal, but my pregnancy was still healthy. Yeah. Um, So. By the end of my pregnancy, I was not sleeping like at all. Um, I was uncomfortable constantly and anybody who's been pregnant knows that towards the end, it's just like the worst. So I wasn't sleeping towards the end of my pregnancy. And I didn't remember this until I was talking to McKay about it tonight. Um, Towards the very, very end of my pregnancy, probably two weeks before I had my son, um, I started having visual hallucinations. And so let me preface this with um, Jordan has always preferred the side of the bed that's furthest away from the door and uh, with her bladder and getting up at night. um, The way our bed was set up was it was really close to the wall because our room was small and uh, it was hard for her to get up at night. So she had me switch sides, which is like a huge no, no, like that never happens ever. Whoops. Um. So I was sleeping on the other side of the bed for a while. Yeah. So that's my preface on this one. So I switched to the other side of the bed and every night I would, because when you're pregnant, you wake up to pee like 15 times a night. Yeah. And so every night, and you get shitty sleep anyway, so every night I would wake up and it scared the shit out of me because every time I would wake up, there would be like a person, an entity, a demon, whatever the hell you want to call it, in my face when I woke up. It's, I mean, it might have been similar to sleep paralysis-y type stuff. Um, but it kind of coincides with what happens later on. So the last two weeks of my pregnancy, I wasn't getting any sleep and I was visually hallucinating and I didn't think anything of it at the time, but that's kind of the start (laughs) of what happened next. She never told me about that until literally tonight. So, 
the more I like, the more I think about things, the more I realize I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. Okay, let me pull up the notes that I have. Suffice it to say that she swatched, well, it makes sense now because eventually she was like, yeah, can I sleep on my side of the bed again? I was like, yeah, sure. Even though it was much worse for me because then I had to like get out of the side of the bed that was more difficult. Okay, so I just wanted to pull out the thing that I have with all my notes on it so I can make sure not to forget anything. So I was done by the end, like by the third trimester, I was like, as soon as I can, I was hoping I would have him early. I was that desperate. Um, so I went to my OB, we're getting close to the end. And then he's like, do you want to get induced at 39? And I was like, hell, hell yeah, yeah, I want to get induced at 39 because I can't take this anymore. So I told him, yep, let's go. That's what I want to do. So keep in mind my entire pregnancy I had this weird feeling about my birth. Like I was, and every woman is nervous about labor. I feel like, and you're, you have like, if you've never had kids before, you have no expectations because you, you don't know. Yeah. And so I had this weird feeling my entire pregnancy that I was going to have to have a C-section and I couldn't shake it no matter what I did. And every single appointment I would go to my doctor and I would wait for some situation to arise where I'd have to have a C-section and nothing would happen. And I even like outright asked my doctor about it multiple times. And he was like, there's no reason for that. You're going to have a vaginal birth. You'll be fine. And so I just kind of sucked it up. But in the back of my mind, I always thought my entire pregnancy that I was going to have a C-section. So uh, 39 weeks, we check into the hospital. It's a Tuesday. Um, We get situated. They put the like most annoying contraction tracker on you so they can keep track of your contractions and the baby's heartbeat. And right off the bat, we notice that there's something weird happening with our son's heartbeat. So it would be like super fast and steady. And then we would have like a quick D cell and then it would come back up again. Yeah. And he did that for the entire time. And when we say D cell, it was like, I think steady at like 120 60 or to one. 70. He dropped from yeah. 120 to like 60 to 70. Yeah. So it was significant. Like nearly half. Yeah. Usually. So the nurse that I had at first was fine. She wasn't great, but she was fine. Um, and obviously she picked up on it right away and said, you know, I'm going to call your OB. We're going to watch this. She's like, it's not like yeah. the biggest deal, but we need to keep an eye on it. So that all happens. And they tell me your OB needs to come down to break your water. And I'm like, okay. So keep in mind, my pregnancy was so, so bad that I thought I was going to have the easiest birth experience because my pregnancy was so bad. That's what I thought going into this. So I really went into labor with a positive attitude because I was really hoping it would be easier than my pregnancy. So my, and I love my OB. He's amazing. He's, I mean, he did my endosurgery. He like, he's fabulous. I love him. Um, And so he came down to break my water. And this is probably like one of the most painful things I've ever had to endure. For whatever reason, they could not get my water to break. Yep. So, this, I, uh, from what I can tell, this is supposed to take like a minute, a minute or two. It took him at least five minutes. They were fishing around in there for five minutes while I was in utter and complete agony. Like, I have a hella high pain tolerance, absolutely high pain tolerance. So these kinds of things would not usually bother me. But this was so extremely painful that I was in tears at the end. Like, and I will not cry oh, yeah. under any seen. circumstance. And I was in tears at the end because I literally couldn't hold it in. And for whatever reason, like, and it wasn't even like he got a little poke. And so it was a slow leak for yeah. the rest of the day. And for so for whatever reason, he just couldn't get it. And the nurse was in there and she was like, relax. And I'm like, you guys are like shoving a hook up in my vagina. How can I relax? Yeah. So that was awful. And that took a ton out of me because that was like, I already have a history of trauma with reproductive areas. And so I was not looking forward to doing cervical checks and things of that nature because one, I have endo, which already makes it painful. And two, I had really intense pelvic pain my whole pregnancy. So that just aggravated it. Yeah. So yeah, that was fun. 
Um, I started out when we got there at two centimeters and I was 70% of faced. So they started me on Pitocin, everyone's favorite, right? And so contractions started to come in. Um, they were like my endo cramps. So I was like, whatever, they're not that bad. And so they progressively start to get worse. And, um, the nurse was like, you know, you can get the epidural at any time. She's like, sometimes it's better to get it earlier on. Cause then you're not trying to like catch up with the pain. And sometimes the anesthesiologist is off doing something else. And so, yeah. Um, me not wanting my pregnancy being so bad, me not wanting to deal with any pain at all. I was just like, just give me the epidural. I don't care. So the anesthesiologist comes down and I was five centimeters at the time. And uh, I'll say this now, (laughs) five centimeters. The anesthesiologist was either new or having a really shitty day Yeah, because she could not correctly place the epidural. And so if you've never seen an epidural needle, don't look it up. <laughs> yeah. If you plan on <laughs> eating an epidural on having kids or having, or having kids, an epidural, don't, don't look, look it up. up. Um, and it's extremely painful because they're literally inserting it like... In your spine. In your spine. Okay. So it's, it's extremely painful. And so it shouldn't be that painful because they're supposed to numb you. So they hit you up with the numbing shit. So it numbs your spine. So you can't feel it. And then they're supposed to do all their fancy epidural shit to get you. So you don't feel anything. So this poor anesthesiologist could not get me numb. She was constantly missing points. And so, and this still like gives me the shivers when I think about it because they literally like, Every time she would push it in, I would flinch because I could literally feel her putting the needle in my spine. And that is a super bizarre feeling, let me tell you. Like, I am sweating just thinking about it because it was so bad. Like, it topped the water breaking experience. And I was like, I didn't think anything could top this. And now we're not even halfway there. And I've already had this other ungodly experience. And so I kind of scared her a little bit because every time she would push it in, I would flinch. And she would be like, you can feel that? And so that... It's yeah. not really great when your medical provider's like, oh my God, you're not supposed to be feeling that. And so we'll get to the other half of that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but every single time she would do it, it would like, so the whole experience was bad and it took them like, it probably took her like 15, 20, 25 minutes to finish the whole thing because she kept having to redo it because she wasn't numbing me properly. And so this is kind of setting the stage for the rest of the agony. So she finishes up finally. I lay back down. I start to feel things going numb. Couldn't really feel anything. And then once the epidural, I feel like, was fully effective and I couldn't feel my legs like whatsoever, um, I kept obviously having contractions and I could feel contractions in one spot, like in my uterus on the left side. I could feel it. It wasn't bad enough that I was like, it was kind of more like a nuisance. Um, and I was like, maybe that spot's just like taking longer to, to numb up. I'm like, okay, that's probably what's happening and it's just going to take longer. And that didn't happen. And it consistent, like the track, the contractions consistently got worse. I continually felt it more. Was it as bad as it would have been without the epidural? Probably not, but nonetheless. So the anesthesiologist leaves and then probably 10 minutes I have the epidural They're like, okay, we need to do a routine check of your blood pressure. I'm like, okay, fine. And so they're having trouble getting the blood pressure monitor to work for whatever reason. And then they finally get a reading. (laughs) And the charge nurse comes running in. There's like four different nurses in the room. The anesthesiologist comes running back in. So I'm like, oh, shit. I'm like, Uh something bad happened. This was after, I think they, they tried four different blood pressure monitors before they had to take it manually yeah the first one they got was 50 over 38 which means i was dead (laughs) so that obviously wasn't accurate but it acted like it was a huge red flag and the charge nurse and everybody came running in um and so i started feeling like clammy i was tight like it was probably like the water breaking experience was draining the anesthesiologist experience was extremely like draining And so by this point, I'm like, so done. Like I am so tired and emotionally drained from those two experiences and physically drained and mentally drained. Like I was only like four o'clock. Yeah. And we'd gotten there at eight in the morning. Yeah. Like, so I wasn't even like, and I wasn't 
dilating fast enough. So I wasn't even like halfway to 10 at that point. And it was that much time had passed. And so the anesthesiologist comes in. Apparently they have to, she had to give me some type of medication for blood pressure. The only anesthesiologist can give, the nurses couldn't give it. I don't understand how it works, but that's what it was. And so, um, I mean, there was like five to six nurses, the charge nurse and the anesthesiologist around me for probably 25 to 30 minutes trying to figure out how the hell they could get my blood pressure back up. And so obviously that's not great because, you know, I still have my son in me. And so all of these things are super stressful and concerning. And his heart thing is still going on. Yeah. His heart thing has continued this entire time. Um, They told my OB about it. My OB wasn't that concerned. So I was trying not to be concerned about it, but my gut told me something was off. Um, And so finally, after like half an hour of frantic nurses and anesthesiologists trying to get my blood pressure back up, it finally started to level out again. And so my pregnancy was so stressful. And then since arriving at the hospital, I've had three extremely stressful experiences. So all I can think about is one, I don't know how the hell I'm going to have the energy to push. And two, I'm nervous about the stress that I'm putting on my son, especially knowing that he's having decelerations for some unknown reason. Yeah. Um, so seven o'clock rolls around. God bless. Nurse Seriously. shift change. <laughs> Uh, let me set the stage for what Jordan was feeling or what Jordan was like from my eyes. Like literally Jordan's always like doing something or has some distraction or whatever, especially if she's stressed. She did not have her phone. We had no TV on. She was just sitting there staring like the entire time. Nothing, no conversation, just kind of there. And I was like doing my best <laughs> keep spirits up but it's hard so i was exhausted and i knew like the only thing i could do was lay there like i was so tired i wasn't even halfway dilated where i needed to be and i was like i don't know how i'm going to like cross the finish line here like i don't know how this is going to happen because at that point when my blood pressure dropped and the anesthesiologist had to give me meds and everything the meds weren't working so they had to call the anesthesiologist back again and she was like no i'm doing an epidural so try to figure it out And so the whole thing was a mess and they had to put oxygen on me at that time too. So for that point on from about, what was that? Like noon when I got the epidural. Yeah. So from that point on, I had the oxygen mask on the entire time. And for those of you that have had those, they get really old (laughs) really fast. And so I had to have that on for the rest of the time. So seven o'clock shift change. And the nurse I had was such a freaking angel. Like I wish I could go back and thank her for being... So freaking amazing yeah, because she was phenomenal. She's great. Like the nurse before her was fine, but I didn't feel connected to her. I didn't feel like she was taking my son's decelerations as seriously as I wanted her to. And she was super, super intent on me having a traditional vaginal birth. And to me, that seemed to kind of fade further and further away as time yeah. went on. Can you tell that she was a little bit older? Yes. Yes, she was. Very nice. Like, yeah. she reminded me of my mom, but not... Same name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But not, like, what I needed. So this nurse comes in and is, like, amazing. And so she gets briefed on what's happening, on my son's chart, on everything. And so she comes in like probably the second or third time after she had chatted with me and she brought in my son, the strip um, of my son's decelerations. And so she's like, I just want to affirm for you that we're not ignoring the situation. She's like, the charge nurse has been watching your, his chart and your chart since you came in. She's like, she's just been sitting at the desk for the most of the day watching your chart. And so she's like, if this was a a, a true emergency, we would wheel you off right away and we would, Mm -hmm. we would act. But she's like, it's not great, but it's not an emergency. So we're just going to watch it and see what happens. And so the nurse that left told her that I was at a four. And mind you, this was with increasing like Pitocin. four or five, I think. Yeah, four yeah. or five. So I was like, shit, I'm halfway there by the time the new nurse came in. And so I had the epidural at that point. So doing cervical checks wasn't painful to me because I couldn't feel anything. Yeah. And so the new nurse. I remember that first one. You were like, oh, man, that's so much better. Because <laughs> I can't feel shit. So it was yeah. so nice. Um, and so the new nurse comes in and she's like, I want to check you because she's like, you've had that much Pitocin. I feel like you should have been further along by now. So her and another nurse comes in and they do the cervical check. And she's like. 
girl. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, okay. So you're, they were telling me about it a five. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, you're a two. And I was like, you've got to be freaking kidding me at this point. Like, it's been 12 like, hours what? now and much, much, much Pitocin. And I'm still sitting at a two. So at this point, I'm so done. Like, oh, yeah. I at least thought, like, during this whole progression that I at least would be somewhere somewhere yeah. and i would like i'm and like we steadily nowhere. getting to somewhere and it, it wasn't like i was in it too and so at this point i was candid with her and i was like i don't know that i have the energy to push and i'm concerned about what's happening with my son and so what are my options um so she's like you have a few but let me go call your ob let me call him and we'll then I'll come back and reconvene with you. And so by this point, I was I was done. Um, I was committed to finding another option other than pushing because I just didn't think I could do it. Like I physically did not have the energy to do it. And so she comes back in and she's like, she sits down. And then, you know, it's like serious. Uh, right? Yeah, she like pulls up a chair. <laughs> and we were like, oh, OK, here Uh-oh. we go. And so she pulls up a chair and she's like, okay, we have some options and we need to talk about them. So they presented a few different options. She's like, we can wait. We can wait a few more hours and see if you dilate. She's like, I I can up your Pitocin and we can see if it gets to where you need to be. She's like, although I am concerned because you've had so much and we, you're not dilating at the rate that you should be. And she's like, so our other option is a C-section and we'll, she's like, it's not emergency, but we'll get him out and do it that way and so by that point i was like yeah i was like hell yeah let's do it sign me up because i physically i was so exhausted by that point like just in that 12 hours they had taken so much out of me i knew i couldn't do it and so they sent me to go get prepped they sent him somewhere else um yeah well i at that point well she calls the OB and literally he walks in in his golf clothes. Like he was just getting off off the course. I was like, dude, this is probably dream situation for this guy because it's eight o'clock. He's rolling in. He's going to be in bed by 10. And he doesn't have to worry about it. Well, that's exactly <laughs> when my nurse called him. That's exactly what he said. He's like, well, I'd rather do it now than at 12, like at 12 a.m. Yeah. when she finally decides. So so he hit the freaking jackpot on that yeah. one. It was weird yeah. seeing him in like but it was people. like holy shit like operation desert shield like just <laughs> swooping in freaking it was quick he, it was so fast I, I, he walked in at like it's i want to say seven. it was like, no it was probably oh based no on that the time, was like probably like 8 30 and um we were in the or at nine <laughs> yeah it was i mean i said yes to the Getting c-section to and it was like it was Bam. like, boom, here's the paperwork, boom, 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 sign like, everything. Everything and... was in motion. Like, there were nurses in and out, anesthesiologists yeah. in and out. And so a fortunate part of it was by the time by the time I was having my C-section and ready to go to the OR, the anesthesiologist had a shift change as well. Yeah. And so I didn't have the same anesthesiologist for the surgery that I did who did my epidural. Um, and so we go in, they get me situated, they lay me on the table. I literally cannot move my legs. So they're like carrying me everywhere, which is super awkward. And I weigh like a ton. So I felt bad. (laughs) So they put me on the thing. I thought it was interesting. They didn't strap me to it. I've seen a lot of people get strapped to the table. They did not strap me to the table. I didn't even realize. Um, so they put me there. Mind you, I'm still wearing a mask. This is during COVID. So all of this was happening. Yeah. We glossed over a lot of that. Yeah. Like I, there was, le- this like is McKay, July 2020. So yeah. it's- McKay didn't come to most of my appointments because they weren't allowing him at the time. I had concerns that he wasn't going to be there for my birth. Um, and so just lots of craziness surrounding that. So everybody's in masks. I've never seen any of my medical providers without a mask on for like the last six months at that yeah. point. And so they get me situated. Um, and then the anesthesiologist comes in and is like, okay, I have to do the work of like numbing the rest of you or whatever for C-section. And I'm like, okay. And so he does this thing. There's like 
tons of people moving around me. It's super unsettling because you're just like on a metal table and there's just like constant flow around oh, you. Yeah. Like everybody is just moving all the time. And you're just kind of like, no one's really talking to you. You're kind of just there because they're like doing their thing and you're just like, oh my God. So the anesthesiologist is like, hey, I've numbed you. I have everything situated. I'm just going to poke you like along your legs and everything and see if you can feel anything. And I'm like, okay. And so he starts poking me and I can't feel anything except for in that one spot that I felt earlier. And so I told him, I was like, I can kind of feel on my left side. I can kind of feel it. And he was like, he gave me this weird ass face. He was like, what? And so he's like, okay, I'm going to do something else. And he's like, I'm going to try again. And I was like, okay. And (laughs) the last thing I remember saying to him was he was like, do you feel it now? And I was like, kind of. (laughs) That was the last thing I said to him. Um, And then he was behind my head for the rest of the time. And so they, I mean, he tells them I'm numbed up. And I'm like, maybe I'm just like imagining it. Like maybe because they tell you with the C-section, like you don't know what to expect pain wise. And they tell you it shouldn't be painful. You should just feel pressure. And it's like even now it like grosses me out to think about. So I was like just imagining pressure. Right. And then they make the cut and I'm like, oh, that's not just pressure. That's not pressure. That's agony. And so the first cut that he made, and I was in shock at the time. I was like, there's no way. Like, there's no way I'm going to sit here and feel this the whole time. And I couldn't, like, my brain, I feel like, went into, like, a dissociative state because it couldn't fathom what was going on. I'm going to cry. I can't cry. So I couldn't... Like, I couldn't find the words. And the anesthesiologist is literally, like, right behind my head. And I couldn't even, like, my body was frozen. Like, my I had access to my hands. And so, literally, I could have, like, grabbed him. And McKay yeah. was next to me the whole time. McKay was on the other side. And so, and the other annoying thing was, for whatever reason, they had the tarp, like, in front of my face the whole time. Oh, yeah. Like the little, I don't know what you would call it, like the little thing so you can't see what's happening down there. They put it so close to me, it was touching my face. <laughs> and so the majority of my C-section, I'm like holding the the tarp out of my face because I'm like, I can't, like, it, I can't yeah. breathe already. And then this shit's like in my face. So I'm like holding up the tarp. And the anesthesiologist never did anything while I'm sitting there like what a goober. holding the yeah. tarp. I'm like, whatever. He was He's an angel, on, but making sure I didn't goober. die. But so I felt my C-section for that whole thing and just that one area and I could feel all of it. And it's really gross when I think about it because I can like it's disgusting. I'm going to trigger some people probably by saying this, but you can like feel the layers <laughs> of like what's inside. Yeah. And so The whole time I'm feeling it in this left side and I can't say anything. I'm in shock. Like my body has like gone into like survival mode. Like I can't speak. Words can't come out. I feel like I'm having like an out of body experience basically. And my only like I thought I was going to die in that moment. And so the best and easiest thing a brain can do in that moment is to check out. And so that's essentially what I did. And so I felt the pain and I felt it the whole time, but I also felt like, I feel like my brain shielded me from some of it. And so I was checked out. I couldn't say anything. Nobody knew what was going on because I couldn't say anything. Like McKay didn't even know anything was going on. Yeah. And I was only there for probably five minutes um, and then he was out. So I was with our son. Most of the time. Yeah. And so... They get him out. I feel it. It's got awful. That was one of the worst parts. So they get him out. I hear him crying. And then I hear, <laughs> I hear them counting on the other side of the tarp. And I'm like, what the hell is happening over there? And they're like, unwinding. Literally <laughs> chanting like, one, two, three, so four. I could only like half hear it because I, you know, I'm trying not to die. And they're unwrapping the umbilical cord for my son's neck. Which was wrapped four times. Four wraps. Which was causing the decelerations. And would have, if I had decided to have a vaginal birth, it would have ended in an emergency C-section because coming down the vaginal canal with that could have been fatal Yeah, for him. And so 
Hello, I made the right choice. Hello, right choice. And so the, the sweet nurse comes to me and she's talking to me. And I can, like, she's telling me, you know, it, this would have been really dangerous if you would have proceeded with a vaginal and you made the right choice. And so I, I know she's talking to me because she's, like, right here. But I literally, like, can't even process what she's saying to me in that moment. Like, I, I can't even respond to her. And so I don't know if she noticed or if I was, she was just like, oh, my God, she's just having a moment. But I, like, it was like I was living in a bubble. Like, I couldn't even hear what the people around me were saying. And so they get him out. So I have like somewhat of a reprieve for a minute because I can hear him crying and he's fine because my my focus was, OK, if I have to die, then I've like he's got to be good. And so that was my focus. And so I was like, OK, we're good. I'm not good. <laughs> we're moving along. And they they're like, OK, now we got to sew you up. My OB was like, you did great. Now we got to sew you up. It, you're almost done. And I was like not saying anything because I couldn't say anything (laughs) and so they work on sewing me up and I don't know if this was just finally because I couldn't advocate for myself I don't know if this was my body's unintentional way of doing it but they were starting to sew me up and I started flinching like on the other side of the tarp where they were and so my OB immediately is like can she feel that and so the anesthesiologist behind me is like suddenly in my face. Like, uh. And it's like, can you feel that? And I was only able to nod yes. And then it was just absolute like frantic, like worse than before. Because I was so far into the C-section, like typically if something like that happens, they'll put you to sleep because there's no like, yeah, it's just gone to shit like we don't have anything to do but basically put you to sleep at that point and it was too far in for them to do that oh hold that speaking thought of. speaking of which dang it we were doing so good without i know <laughs> any cuts anyway so the anesthesiologist realizes what's happening and i can tell that he's frightened <laughs> I can see it on his face, which is really unsettling because he's kind of the person in charge of making sure that I don't feel any pain. And so he's like, wait, you're feeling that? And it was like a total disaster at that point. Um, So they can't stop sewing me up because my guts are literally open on the table. Um, Risk of bleeding out and infection and things like that are too high and they can't put me to sleep. So his only option is to basically push a bunch of pain meds. And so he's pushing pain meds and then every few minutes he's asking me, can you still feel it? Yep. Can you still feel it? Yep. And so he reaches the max amount of pain meds that he can give me and I can still feel it. And so, and it was still agonizing even with three rounds of pain meds. And he's like, I can't give you any more. Like I'm at my limit, which is like super awesome. Awesome. When you're sitting there feeling your C-section from start to finish and I can, it's disgusting. I can feel everything. I can feel them playing with my guts. I can feel the layers. I can feel them moving my uterus around. I can feel all of it. And so he's like, I'm like SOL at this point. So I'm like, I just get to sit here. This is really awesome. And so, um, they continue sewing me up. I think they said it took about a half hour. I feel like I was laying there for eternity. Um, the whole the whole operation was about a half hour. Really? Yeah. That's fucking nuts. Way to go. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was about a half hour. I think we went in there around 9.15, and then we were out by like 9.45. That's insane, because yeah. I feel like I was laying there for hours. Yeah. And so he's pushed all these pain meds, and I don't know if it was the pain meds or just the stress of the experience, but I start to get super nauseous. Um, so... I was in so much pain and such a dissociative state that I wasn't even nervous about puking at that point. I didn't want to, um, but I like I was worried about dying. That was like the least of my worries at that point. And so I'm like, I'm getting nauseous. I'm getting nauseous. Plus, I have a mask on. That's not helping. Um, and so he was like, um, I can give you anti-nausea meds. And so he gives me anti-nausea meds. Is it helping? No. Second round, is it helping? No third round he's maxed out I can't have any more um and so I finally hear from the other side of the tarp that they're done and I immediately throw up like it was they told me they were done and I puked an Um, inch over the finish line (laughs) yeah so I wasn't lying when I said she made it the whole time without puking yeah and so I felt better 
Um, but I was so like, I was in such a shitty state that I was barely like, I was barely able to not puke like on myself. Like I'm like trying to puke off the table while I'm like laying this way on the table. And so it's like half over me. And so the poor nurses are like trying to clean me up and I can't even like, I can't even do anything. I'm just sitting there. Like I literally cannot do anything. And they, I remember them showing me my son and I remember just being relieved that he was okay. Um, but then beyond that, I was just focused on survival. Like I, I could not focus on pain and survival. Those are my, my only two things. And so they wheel us back to whatever postpartum labor room, labor delivery room. And then they moved us to postpartum and we had really great, nice nurses after the fact, um, the poor anesthesiologist felt really bad. <laughs> um, I kind of felt bad for him because it wasn't his fault because he no. didn't place the epidural. Um, once that epidural is placed, it kind of sets the stage for the C-section if you're going to have one. And so if that previous anesthesiologist hadn't screwed it up, he would have been able to probably do it effectively and I wouldn't have had the problem. Um, so he felt so bad. He followed us back to like my doctor was already probably in bed and he followed us back to the room and um, he was like, I, I know you're in so much pain. Like what what can what can I do? And I'm like, I like I'm you tell me, doc. <laughs> I'm like, what are my options? Like, I don't even know. And he's like, I can give you a nerve block. And he's like, it's not fun to do. And they had to pull out like a. Oh, is it like an ultrasound thing? Yeah. Like an ultra, like they have to pull out an ultrasound to look at the area to make sure that they're getting the nerve. I can't like, yikes. I've removed that part of it too, because it was, it was so hard for me to process, but I was in so much pain at that point that he could have said, I'm going to rip your arm off. And I would have been like, that's fine. It's not going to hurt as bad as what I just experienced. Um, and so I, I, I didn't care. I was, he's like, sometimes the nerve blocks don't work. And I was like, I don't give a shit. And he's like, it hurts to place. And I'm like, I don't care. Like it, it couldn't have been worse than what I had just experienced. And so from that point on, I felt super like disconnected. Like I had just been through probably one of the most traumatic experiences of my life and I couldn't like make myself be present. And so I held my son a few times in the hospital, but to be honest, I do not remember most of the experience. I remember McKay having him for ma the majority of the time. I remember feel guilty of being, ugh, feeling guilty about that right off the bat, which is like within minutes of becoming a mother, the mom guilt sets in. So yeah. <laughs> I remember that, but for the most part, I don't remember the hospital experience. I remember showering for the first time. Like that was an enlightening experience because <laughs> you're so disgusting after everything and you're sweaty and you're gross. Um, and then you've got, you've got a catheter in and you're like, I had a like crazy nerve pain, obviously from the C-section and so all of that. And then you go and take a shower and it's like, it's a whole weird experience because most women give birth and don't recognize themselves, <laughs> but it, it's hard for a variety of reasons. So that all happened. Um, it was super great. <laughs> and we go home and I'm still trying to process everything. I have such severe pain from the C-section that I basically can't do anything. Um, I could basically walk to pee and back. And that was the bulk of my walking. Um, and most people, nurses would be like, oh my God, that's so bad. But... I feel like my C-section pain, because of what I experienced, doubly made the pain worse. And so I literally, like, that's all I could handle for that time. And I felt bad because I didn't want to be taking, like, the hard prescription drugs because I, I rarely ever take them. And so I don't even, I don't even remember how often I was taking them because I usually fight pain meds pretty hard. Yeah. I, I think you were taking them less often that you needed yeah which was stupid or taking a half dose stupid i can't remember so we get home um the reality of having a newborn <laughs> starts to set in um our son was super easy at first <laughs> and i feel like he threw us a curveball because he had reflux issues 
So he would just scream and scream and scream and scream at the top of his lungs. Um, all night long. All night long. Yeah. And so we were kind of alternating going back and forth with that. And this is this is probably where people start to get interested because postpartum psychosis like is like grabby, yeah. right? Well, and just to set up the situation, I had one week unpaid paternal leave. So even the the Mormon church, we love families. Yeah, you get one week paternity leave unpaid. Oh, cool. And I took two weeks of my vacation time. So I was off for three weeks after the fact, which was nice. Which was needed because I don't know how I would have made yeah, it through I don't know. It with been just like a week. Like really there would have been no way. So I start to see, and I'll, I'll put timestamps so people like know where to begin if you're only interested in this piece because I know this is long, but essentially things just start to get weird when I get home. Um, there's kind of a... I start to feel like something's off. Like I, I'd struggled with depression and anxiety before like during my pregnancy. The third trimester, I was on super, super low dose Prozac. Um, and it was manageable. And then I was obviously after my traumatic birth and everything, it was like unmanageable. Um, depression started to kick in. Um, anxiety started to kick in. And so those things started to add up, and that's when things kind of started getting bizarre. So let me pull up my little notes here. Okay. So hallmarks of what I was dealing with, which I didn't know was postpartum psychosis at the time. I started hearing voices, um, and I didn't, like, at the time, I really didn't acknowledge that they were voices, but I knew that they weren't mine. Um, so they centered around my son, and they centered around the people around my son. So I was absolutely convinced, um, not of McKay, but McKay's the only person I trusted to be with him. Um, but I was convinced that everybody else was out to, like, kill my son. Like, I was absolutely convinced. Like, even, like, family members that I trusted and was okay with and I knew it was irrational, but I was I was convinced that they were going to kill yeah. my son. It took you a while to, to move him out of our room because it just wasn't sustainable. And even then, like, before we moved out of that house, he was almost six months old by the time we moved him from right outside of her door. Like, he was literally, like... He was in the living room because our bedroom was off the living room. Like we were, we moved him out of our room at my therapist's request and put him like dead outside of our door. So if you walked outside our bedroom door, you would have run into him because that's the furthest I could get him yeah. from me because I was so worried about it. And we also had, we had an outlet that we used with him that kept track of his um, heartbeat and his little whatever yeah. the hell. Which I full on get the people who are probably going, oh, great. And it was a blessing and a curse because it helped Jordan know that he was okay, but it would harm her by causing her to obsess over it. She yeah. would just lay awake and watch the little monitor. So I had really, like, that was part of it, is I had really extreme paranoia. And so I always felt like... I wasn't stable. Like I always felt like there was something going wrong and I knew it was coming and I didn't know what it was, but I knew that it was going to be bad and I had to protect my son from it. And like, it literally makes no sense. Like it didn't make any sense to me at the time, but it was so real for me that I couldn't like, I, I can usually like, I'm very good at this point at rationalizing my way through like my OCD intrusive thoughts and my anxiety but I couldn't do it with that. Yeah, no. And so combine that with those kind of weird things with postpartum depression, which started to set in. Um, and the psychosis and depression would just feed off each other because, and then you throw anxiety in there as well. And then you throw OCD in there. 
because I have a depression, anxiety, and an OCD diagnosis. And so when you add those three things into postpartum psychosis, it just creates essentially this shit storm <laughs> of things yeah. that are happening. Because I'm having compulsions around checking my son to make sure he's breathing. And then I've got the postpartum psychosis making me think that everybody's out to kill me and my son. And then I've got the depression, which is like, I am absolutely miserable and I am in a hole and I'm never going to come out of it. And it's awful. And then I've got anxiety, which is, again, constantly checking my son, being afraid something's wrong with me, something's wrong with him. So we just have this, like, total freaking. <laughs> and religious scrupulosity. Yeah. And my. Don't forget about that one. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit at the end because that plays a huge role as well. And so I had all those diagnoses, diagnoses, and then I. I knew I was in a bad space and I knew I needed to get a therapist. So I started looking for somebody who. Um, specialized in postpartum women because I'm like this isn't like this somebody has to know like somebody has yeah. to help me I'm stuck like I'm I had extreme suicidal ideation frequently um I remember one night that I literally took everything in the house that I thought I could possibly hurt myself with and I gave it to my mom so she could put it somewhere that I wouldn't know where it was because I was that afraid that I was going to hurt myself I think I think I self-harmed once that I can remember when we were there. Yeah. I think it was only once. I don't really have much of a history with that. I did that as a teenager during a depressive episode, but um, I was in such a shitty spot. I felt like it was the only thing I had control over. Um, so I'm also having some really weird things that I didn't have before. Um, I've started to be extremely impacted by loud noises um, like if McKay were to like, not that he yells, but if he were to like yell at my mom or something or yell at somebody to do something from like upstairs, um, it would be extremely triggering for me if he like dropped something, like if he dropped a plate. Um, oh, I remember the first time that I noticed I opened the freezer and a bag of something God, fell out that. and she like up the wall like flipped i had no control over it but it like the only way i can describe it is when like when you have a trigger like that you want to like crawl out of your skin like you can't be in your body anymore like and you have like no control over what's going on within you so it's like the most frustrating thing because you're out of control and you can't like there's nothing you can do about it you can't fix it you can't undo it you kind of just have to sit with it and it, it is like so uncomfortable. Like even to this day, if I have a trigger like that, like I remember how it felt and I I was getting triggered constantly. My son crying would trigger me. Anything falling would trigger me. Like and think about things happening in a day. Sometimes you yeah. drop shit. Like you can't always prevent yeah. that from happening. And so having that happening all the time and my son being a trigger for me was also really difficult. Because he can't control it. He's a newborn. He screams. <laughs> That's just what it is. Yeah. But I didn't know what was happening. So I remember one time that I got triggered so bad I ran outside in the street. Remember that? Yes. What was that by? I don't know. We were just out there and I was like, mm, this is the winter. Yeah. Mind you. <laughs> and I'm out there without shoes on in the I'm street. like, uh, you good? And so all of these things are like the intersection of all of these things and postpartum psychosis and voices and all of these things are happening. And then I start having flashbacks um, of my surgery. I start having flashbacks of my C-section um, and all that pain. Like, and when I got home from the hospital, like people, like people would ask me how it was and I couldn't even talk about it. Like I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. If I did, I was like sobbing profusely. Um, and that was another thing, but this is super common for postpartum women is to like profusely sob when you get home from the hospital, it's hormones and things are all kinds of whack. Um, and so I remember that cause I'm not a crier. I've never been a crier. No. Um, and I remember that first night home I was in one, I was in so much pain. I was constantly being triggered. I was hearing voices and having mild hallucinations and I just sat there and cried. I was absolutely hysterical, which is like so out of character for me. I was just hysterical. 
Um, and it's kind of weird because even when, like, even when I wasn't triggered and I was okay, I would cry. And it's just like a normal hormonal thing, but you just yeah. have no control of it. And you don't feel relatively in control of your body because it's doing so many things. Plus, I was lacking bodily autonomy for nine months because of my son. And so I was just finally getting the feeling back that I had me back. And then I have flashbacks of what's happening with my surgery. And it was making me like super unsettled. So all this is happening. And I go to a therapist who's a freaking postpartum specialist rock star. Um, I owe a ton to her. Um, and I go through and I talk about everything. This woman is a superhero. She really is. Like, if I left Jordan, she would eventually be okay. But if, for whatever reason, like, her therapist moved or whatever, she would never recover. Like, (laughs) this woman has worked wonders. I'm so thankful for her. I love her. Um, she's been hugely she's been the biggest help in navigating all this. So I explain all of it to her and I dump all of this on her and my traumatic birth and everything. Um, and I'm telling her about the voices and things and she's like, obviously very concerned. Um, and she's like, first of all, she's like, let me tell you, um, everything that was, that happened at the hospital was mishandled. Like, First of all, nobody acknowledged your pain. First of all, nobody acknowledged that anything was wrong. Um, nobody, like, there was no action that happened. Nobody yeah. came to me afterwards to discuss it. Um, nothing. Nothing happened. And so she's like, in complete and utter honesty, you should have had an entire crisis team that responded to what happened to you. She's like, an entire crisis team. She's like, I'm talking multifaceted approach. And and you didn't have that. You just sucked it up and you went home. And so she told me a few things. And then she's like, you know, we're going to watch it. But you have all the harm- hallmarks of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so with PTSD, you usually have to have symptoms for more than six months before they'll diagnose it. Before that, it's called acute stress disorder. Um, and so six months later, I'm still having crazy intense flashbacks. I'm still having, um, like the loud noises and the triggers and all that is attributed to PTSD. Um, cause your body kind of just exists in fight or flight mode and there, mm-hmm. like, there's no, like you're stuck in fight or flight. You're like my, your brain is always scanning for danger. And that's essentially for the for for probably seven to eight months after I had my son. That's how my brain every single was. day. I was constantly scanning for danger. I was constantly scanning for people that were going to kill my son. I was constantly scanning for the people that were going to kill me. Like I was constantly in that space. I was just constantly looking for danger. And that's exhausting when you can never get out of that. And then to make matters worse, we have my scrupulosity, which is part of, um, it's part of OCD. Um, Sometimes it's called religious OCD. And so the problem with religious scrupulosity especially is I was so ingrained in Mormonism at the time that I was like convinced like totally convinced that my like my difficult pregnancy my difficult birth um and my difficulty with postpartum was a punishment from God I was like my entire pregnancy I felt like God was punishing me And then when you get like the ultimate traumatic birth and then psychosis, I was absolutely convinced that I was being punished. And one of the hallmarks of um, postpartum psychosis, one of the things that frequently happen is religious delusions. And so I was completely convinced that because of the like the sins that I had as a teenager when I was really rebellious and stupid, Um, And when I was going against basically everything, anything Mormonism, I did the opposite Mm -hmm. because I was rebellious. That's just what I was doing. I was absolutely convinced that this was a punishment from God because of my sins from that time, Um, which is insane. Um, But again, religious delusions are a huge part of, of postpartum psychosis. So... Um, and also I remembered, and this is kind of, I think where a lot of it stemmed from was I had a primary teacher when I was a kid, um, 
when I was super little because I, I felt like it was really bizarre and inappropriate that she was telling us this, but I nonetheless remember it to this day. A church primary teacher. Yeah. Just she go. um she had a son with a disability and I know this person. Yeah. She had a son with a disability. Her son was my age. Yep. Yeah. And she told us as primary children, I must have been like eight or nine. Like I was not old. Um but she told us that she had had a son before she was married um, and that she felt that God was punishing her because she had a son with a disability. And so the whole like story was that, yes, she thought that was what was happening. But in reality, it wasn't. wasn't. Um, but my mind was so fixated on that. Plus, Mormonism, like if you've watched any of our other videos, you know, Mormonism on the whole is Mormon God is super conditional and very vindictive and punishment based. Um, and so I don't think it was really that outlandish for me to think that. Um, like the more I process the intersection of my psychosis and, and Mormonism, I feel like Mormonism fueled my psychosis. Um, At least fan the flames. It did. It was a yeah. perfect breeding ground for taking everything that Mormonism had taught me and the fear and the vindictiveness and the punishment and the sins and um, repentance and feeling like maybe there were other things that I hadn't repented for and maybe that's why I was being punished or I didn't repent right. Um, like I didn't go to my bishop enough or I didn't like I didn't repent correctly. And so therefore I hadn't been forgiven, which is why I was being punished. Um, and then I was also super prescriptive in everything that I asked for. Like if I prayed, like my praying would take so long because I had to be so, 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 and this got really bad during my psychosis. I had to be so specific about the things that I prayed for. Like if it involved my son, I would be like, okay, I'm going to pray that my son will sleep well and that he will be fine and he's not going to stop breathing. And so I'd be like, okay, I pray that my son will sleep. And I would have to say, no, not just sleep, sleep until next morning. Well, maybe next morning isn't specific enough. My son's going to have to sleep until next morning at 6 a.m. where he's going to wake up and be fine because if I was so worried that if I prayed incorrectly that God was going to kill my son. It was like making a wish on the monkey's paw. Like She it was would insane. formulate her prayers around not getting the gotcha moment. Yeah. I was so, so, and that's why I would spend so much time praying because I was so, so scared that I was going to say something or like I would pray like that McKay would get home safely from work. And I couldn't just say that because what if home is like heaven? And so I'd be like, I pray that McKay is going to come home to our house at this address at this time safely. Imagine doing that with every aspect of your life. It was absolutely exhausting. And I was so convinced that if I screwed up by even a minor, minor sense that I was going to pay for it, which is really sad. So religious OCD played a major role in obviously religious delusions um, in my psychosis. And so with all of this, um, the most significant thing that helped was my therapist, obviously. <laughs> She's um, the bomb. There is, there's a lot of, there's not a lot of information about postpartum psychosis because it's pretty rare. Um, and when it does happen, I think this is probably where the majority of the stigma comes from, is the suicide rate for people who have postpartum psychosis is extremely high. Um, and the infanticide rate is also high. Um, and so I think there's a lot of stigma attached to it because of that. And the research also states that postpartum, postpartum women who have postpartum psychosis are more likely to commit suicide by violent means um, rather than like a quiet method, like yeah. overdosing on something. Um, it's typically violent, like jumping off a building or throwing yourself into traffic or things of that nature. Like they're, the postpartum deaths of women who had it are extremely violent. Um, and which I think tells you a lot <laughs> yeah. about how bad psychosis, like it's awful. And it's to, I mean, you're absolutely convinced that your life would be easier if you weren't in this hole that you're in right now and everybody would be better off without you. Um, 
So I think that's a lot of reason why it's not shared and it's super uncommon. And I mean, it's really not common amongst women. Um, but the story, I mean, it just makes it kind of shameful because nobody really wants to talk about it because we have this mental health stigma attached to psychosis, like in any form. Um, you know, there's stigma attached to antipsychotics. There's, you know, people who just call people on the regular psychotic for no reason. Like, yeah. There's a lot of stigma attached to it. And then we just don't, we don't take care of postpartum women. We don't like you get one postpartum yeah. visit and your doctor sends you on your way. We're coming up on a year of Jordan visiting with her ther- therapist. She meets with her every two weeks and we have paid out of pocket every single time. And this is like, we're talking a desperate situation here. Like my therapist was very concerned upon working with me yeah. um, at first. And so that my therapist in combination with medication um, has gotten me to a point where we are stable now. Um, I still, I got diagnosed with PTSD because my flashbacks and my triggers have remained for, for a year now. Um, and so I, I still deal with that, um, which sucks. PTSD sucks. Um, and doesn't like, I think PTSD is, we're starting to get away from just being like the, the veteran diagnosis, you know, the people coming back from war, which obviously it's super, it's highly common among vets yeah. i mean they're traumatic experiences but any kind of traumatic experience can cause ptsd um and what trauma is is going to vary for everyone and so having ptsd sucks but i am a far far a far cry a far cry that, from where yeah, it was a year ago i am extremely proud that jordan was able to speak about this because it has been very difficult to speak even in like a casual sense for a really long time so that speaks volumes true as to uh, how far she's come literally it's been crazy and there's hiccups every now and then like a couple months ago we were out walking with our son and literally right as we walked by a car the alarm went off and it like threw her off for the rest of the day and the other day, um, Ben, our son dropped a plate. Oh, yeah. Floor. That wasn't so bad, but she was definitely thrown off for a little while. It's frustrating because you can't yeah. control it. And it, I oh, mean, it will with come. Baby. Yeah. And it will come and hit you out of nowhere. Like it will, like, it's just a smack in the face and you're right back where you started. Um, and that's why, like, that's why I don't typically talk about my birth experience because it typically triggers flashbacks for me, (laughs) which are not fun, Yeah. but it's, it's been a far cry from where it was a year ago. Okay. Let me look at questions. Okay. We're going to, Jordan put out on Instagram, um, on her story, having people ask questions, uh, for the sake of not having to, uh, edit these things. I'm just going to have her read them and answer them. Do you think you'll have another child in the future? I say pretty emphatically no. Um, There's no aspect of my pregnancy or my birth or postpartum that was enjoyable for me. And so, and because of how bad it was, it's, yeah, I have a hard time ever thinking that I will ever be in a position where that would be okay. Because especially having PTSD, All of that, like the whole... It's just re-triggering yourself. It would be a whole experience of triggering. Like there... It would be unavoidable. It would absolutely be unavoidable. And I I know there are people out there who've had traumatic births and then go on to have like very healing births um, in the future. And I'm not dogging on that at all. But just my particular experience um, is a no. Plus, I feel like we're just suited for an only child, I feel like. Yeah, he's a... He's a hoot. He's a lot. <laughs> He's a lot. Um, how can we encourage others to seek or ask for help? Um, I think being a voice of reason, especially if you think someone's really struggling, and just being outright and saying maybe it would help to talk to someone. Um, and if they're that in deep, it might be helpful to like provide that information for them, provide them someone to talk to so they don't have to look it up themselves because they're they're not in a space where they can do that. 
Yeah, there's a million ways. If somebody's in confidence with you to be able to suggest, like, if they're willing to share something with you and be like, oh, have you thought about sharing this with a professional or something like that? And there, there's a large amount of women who are hospitalized because of psychosis. Um, and so if it, if it is that severe and you are like really concerned about hurting themselves or their child, I mean, the safest thing to do is to hospitalize them and get them help yeah. because sometimes that's the only way. Let's also, uh, turn down the stigma about hospitalizing people over mental health issues, because especially in a case like that, it's for their safety and for their child's safety. Yeah. It's a good thing. Like, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. And it just, like, it just depends on your, like, no postpartum psychosis looks the same. Like, it's all going to oh, yeah. be different. Like, I never had thoughts of hurting my son, but I know women who have. Yeah. And so, it, like, my thoughts were focused on protecting my son and, like, not getting us killed somehow. Um, but it's going to be different for everyone. Um. How was your support system? How would you have preferred it to be? I wished I would have had, like what my therapist talked about, I wished I would have had the medical side and the mental health support system like in the hospital. Um, I feel like that would have been really big for me. That's part of the reason why I'm doing my my MSW internship yeah. at a hospital. <laughs> the same hospital. At the same hospital I had my son. Because um, I feel like... If you're, especially if your birth was that traumatic and you're having struggles that bad at the hospital, I feel like it's just so much easier to let people intervene at that time and not having yeah. to go home and let things get worse and then eventually have to go back. Yeah. Or even like by the time that you've been at home and things have gotten worse, who knows where you'll be on a waiting list to get into with a therapist. Exactly. Exactly. And Jordan was really lucky because I think you only waited a week or two. Mm -hmm. Now she would not have been able to get into I would have been on a waiting one. list. Yeah. So I, th but my home support system I think was good. I have good family members here who care about him. And I, yeah. ultimately I had McKay. McKay was my biggest thing. Like I would not have made it out the other side of anything pregnancy birth or postpartum if it wasn't for McKay like he was the only one she's, she's good <laughs> he was the only one I trusted especially with our son and so when I mean I was basically useless for a while and so he really had to step up which I appreciated I do my best um did you realize the psychosis was happening or did someone intervene I did not realize it was psychosis until my therapist brought it up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just like that night that she ran out in the street. I was like, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just vibing over here. Whatever. Here's some shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, recommendations to future moms from your experience. Um, that's a good question. I think knowing about these things is really helpful. That's why I want to talk more about yeah. postpartum psychosis because while it is rare, it still happens. They say for every thousand women that give birth, it'll be one or two. Um, so this isn't to try to dissuade people from... No, not at all. ...having children. We think it's a great thing, but it's also important to know what could happen so that there's some sort of outline of a... Uh, a strategy to right and the two the two biggest factors for having postpartum psychosis for being like more at risk than other people is having a bipolar disorder diagnosis so if you have that you are like way more likely to develop postpartum psychosis and the second thing is if you've ever had um a psychotic episode in the past so those are the two things that are huge predictors of postpartum psychosis so if you have any type of bipolar disorder one or two um, this is something really to be mindful of because your, your risk for, for getting it is that much higher, especially if you have a family history of bipolar disorder. So that's something to keep in mind. I think the biggest thing is to just be aware of what could happen. Mm -hmm. Like for the majority of you that haven't had kids that might in the future that are watching this, you probably won't ever have to deal with anything like this. Um, you might get postpartum, like you might have postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety. Those things are much more common, um, 
a little bit less stigmatized, but still pretty stigmatized. And I think just have the biggest thing is to have a plan. Like if these things do happen, you have a plan of what you're going to do. And I think the biggest piece in that is to have your partner be a part of that plan. Yeah. So share with them. Or somebody that can stand in place of that role. Yeah. Because we recognize that not everybody has a partner who's willing to be a part of things. Yeah. And those people suck. So have like a family member or a friend. So tell them if I start doing X, Y, Z, here's what you need to do because if it is super severe they need to know yeah what to do and it i mean it's always good to have a plan because in reality are you gonna need it maybe not no but it is nice to have it um have you dealt with body image during and postpartum i'm the wrong person to ask about this let me tell you how many times i have to get at jordan for being self-deprecating that's an issue because everything else has been more pressing and more severe this has been like on the back burner for me but i had a hugely difficult time during my pregnancy because of how much weight i gained like i literally gained weight in so many places i have stretch marks literally everywhere because i have never been that size before Mm -hmm. Um, 80 pounds more. Yeah, 80 pounds heavier than I was. And so because of that, I feel like I've dropped 50 or 60 since then. I think you've dropped more. 60, yeah. So I've dropped some since then, but I feel like mine is no different than any postpartum woman after, yeah, like you're... Yeah. It takes some adjusting to adjust to what your body looks like now because it's it's not the same. And it's like it's not going to look the same because you've had this huge impact on your body and obviously it's going to look different. So yeah. it's just taking me time. <laughs> she looks great. It's taking me time to adjust to it. And I think I'll probably address that with my therapist later on when I'm not working on so much trauma. Um, <laughs> but yeah. It's an onion. It's a trauma onion. There's layers. Um, did doctors ever explain to you why your anesthesia failed? No. <laughs> they did not. Nobody ever talked about it after the fact. Like, after the anesthesiologist did that nerve block, that was the last time I saw him. Yeah. And there was no discussion after that. No. We just kind of cursed the name of that other anesthesiologist, and then you just move on. Yeah. Um, I don't think we even would have had a case for medical malpractice or anything like that either. (laughs) No, I don't think we would have either. Did you learn anything about yourself while it was going on? Um, I feel like everybody kind of internalizes mental health stigma a little bit. Um, like even... As I'm entering, like, as I'm working on my MSW and entering the field as a mental health professional, like, everybody has stigma attached in some way or another because it's ingrained in us. And so I think one of the biggest things that I took away from this experience was even I had majorly stigmatized psychosis. um, And it kind of in a, that kind of stuff doesn't happen to me kind of thing. And then it happens to you. (laughs) Yeah. Like it doesn't happen to you until it does, right? And then your perspective kind of shifts. Um, I think the other thing was my traumatic birth opened up my traumatic childhood, unfortunately, which often happens if you're not aware. Um, a lot of times postpartum women that are struggling start to unearth um, traumatic memories from childhood and it's super, super common. And so I did not know that was going to happen. And so I've been working through that in addition to everything else. And so that's also something to be aware of. But I think overall, it was just a growing go with the flow experience. Yeah. Because I like to control things and there was not anything of this experience really that I could control. (laughs) We were just rolling with the punches. Yeah. Which you have to do. I mean, especially when you're dealing with that kind of thing. Exactly. How long did it take you to fully recover? Have you fully recovered? I still don't feel like I fully recovered. No. I still have nerve pain from my C-section scar. Um, I'm still, I still have triggers from the PTSD. Um, So I feel like in a lot of ways I have 
but in yeah. a lot of ways I haven't at the same time. The worst part was Jordan being so discouraged um, because she couldn't help but set expectations of where she thought she should be. And she's like, I feel like I should be further along right now. I'm like, woman, t- you can take the rest of your life to deal with this. Like, I will be right here. Don't worry about it. Like, that's why he's the best. Just go. But mom guilt is real. <laughs> need to do. Yeah. Oh, my God. And it's she's freaking always like, real. But I need to do more. I'm like, bud, chill. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's see. Was it all consuming or did it come in waves? I feel like both. I feel like at times it was all consuming. And then at times it was also, I would get waves of it. It was like swells in the middle of the ocean where you're already really deep. And then sometimes it just gets deeper. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, should I be worried about my mental illness impacting future children? Um, it depends on what what mental illness you have. Um, there are some that are fairly hereditary, like bipolar disorder. Um, but there's also a lot of factors in the mix with most mental illnesses when yeah. you're talking about hereditary and genetic type things. Um, I would say, like, research it. Sometimes it's helpful to see what the numbers are. Like I have, I've looked into some things with my son and the numbers are like less than 5%. And so that's like being able to say that is really affirming to me. Cause I'm like, okay, there's, you know, 95% chance that he's not going yeah. to develop, um, what I have. And so that can help. And I would just say, be aware. He could also go to a genetic counselor too, if you're super concerned about it and have them talk to you about it and what your, what the odds are. Um, that's what they do for a living. So. If you can afford it or have your insurance cover it, that would yeah. probably be helpful. Insurance probably doesn't cover it, but. Um, did anyone not believe you? Um, I think with my older family members, there's a level of not oh, understanding. Well, it's not that bad, kind of. <laughs> it's not that bad. You're fine. Suck it up. Deal with it. Very much like yeah, boomer like- attitude. Yeah, like, how can you still be dealing with this six months, eight months? You should be over it by now, yeah. that type of thing. So I try not to let that get to me. Um, yeah, please don't be that kind of person. Everybody heals in their own time. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any idea prior to your birth that it would be traumatic? I reckon that gut feeling that I had that I wasn't going to, that I was going to have a C-section was my body preparing me. Um, that's my thought. There's nothing medical to back that up, but that's what my gut says. When did McKay realize something was wrong? When did I realize something was wrong? With your pregnancy or (laughs) when I, I mean, as soon as we came home and you were unable to like, do a lot of things i was like okay maybe we need to see a professional or whatever but i i knew jordan was going to find that on her own because she's always been really good at um researching mental health professionals and things like that um but especially on the days where i would come home from work and she would just be like visually exhausted like i i knew that she would need a little extra help good answer um lots of you asked if i'm mentally prepared to share this <laughs> which i appreciate Absolutely. looking out for me i appreciate you um let's see What did the anesthesiologist say when you told him that you were still feeling pain? He didn't say anything, (laughs) but his face. (laughs) I I wish I could have seen. I was over off in the other room with the child. His face said it all. It was shock, (laughs) fear, like frightened. I like I can't. I can still see his face clear as day. Yeah, poor guy. Um, do you know what triggered your psychosis? Um. I'm starting to have an idea now um, because of some things that have happened the last few months. Um, I ended up like a month maybe ago with a bipolar two type two bipolar diagnosis. Um, 
And it's extremely, like, the odds of you getting postpartum psychosis are much, much higher if you are bipolar or have bipolar 2, um, which we're now realizing that I do. Yeah. So I'm thinking that played a huge role in why it happened. I mean, it makes sense with the odds. Aside from the trauma. Aside from the trauma. (laughs) I'm sure that didn't help. Um... What made you realize that it was psychosis and not reality? I had a really hard time differentiating. I mean, I was trying, um, but eventually, like, I I couldn't. It was a balance because, like, I, I, like, still to this day, like, I knew it was irrational, but I was also feeling it was so real. So it was really hard for me to parcel out which was which, which is all psychosis. Yeah is essentially i mean it's all things that you think are happening that are evidently not but you're you're convinced and then throw religious delusion in there so i think there was small parts of me that knew things were not the way i was thinking that they were but i was also majorly convinced that it was and so it wasn't until upping my medication that i was on at the time and talking with my therapist that i started to realize that it really wasn't reality based in reality um do 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 how did you feel sexually after the trauma that's a good question i feel like that's still a work in progress because i had i had sexual trauma from childhood and then you factor in this and birth trauma because like even though it's not like birth trauma and sex don't exactly go hand in hand but it's still trauma to the reproductive area um so it definitely impacts things but we have a good open communicative relationship where i feel like as long as we've been honest with each other yeah and we found like workarounds for things too yeah and even just not beyond sexuality but like physical affection and things like that we had to basically just scrap it all and stop like build from nothing because i have always been like oh jordan's bending over let me slap her butt like (laughs) which is kind of (sighs) patriarchal of me um but that was one of the things that her therapist recommended and jordan literally like she talks with her therapist i'm at work and she's like okay i have to tell you something and this is what my therapist talked to me about and you can't hate me and she was hoping that maybe you could help i was like Okay. She's like, okay, maybe you could, if you want, which, okay, (laughs) of course I want to help. Like, um, instead of like even touching me, like grabbing my hand or anything like that, ask me before I do that or before you do that so that my brain can understand it's not an attack on (laughs) me because she was in fight or flight four months. Yep. So even like him touching me, my brain would be like, ah, yeah. So you have to be able to reestablish, reestablish from square zero. Yeah. Literally. So, um, was there anything beforehand that prepped you for this experience or was it entirely unexpected? Nothing. (laughs) I don't feel like I was prepared for any of this. (laughs) It just kind of happened. That's almost a little self-inflicted because we're like, let's just let it happen. We're not going to read any like birthing books or anything. We just let it we're happen. Just, there are people there to help us. And yeah. We didn't that even was need. Our yeah. Maybe that's not the greatest way to come about it, but that's what we did. Yeah. How did it affect your relationship with McKay? I feel like our relationship is that much stronger because of it. Like I feel like yeah. it's like added layers to our relationship that weren't weren't there before for sure i yeah i feel like we're I, we were always always super strong always on the same page leaving the mormon church at the same time like after the fact after our son was born but yeah we were always really good at communicating with each other about our relationship at least how did you bond with your son while dealing with postpartum psychosis So surprisingly, and even my therapist was surprised by this after probably it was after my like C-section scar started to heal more. Mm -hmm. 
and I could move more. I wanted to get more involved with my son, partially because I was feeling bad because McKay was doing so much. Um, and so I did start doing things for him and through that process, um, he also like, if he was inconsolable, he had to come to me in order to calm down. And so that at least gave me purpose. I felt like I was able to do something with him that nobody else could do. Um, so that helped. And then I just started doing things for him and with him. Like I started like, even as something as simple as like changing diapers and that got me more involved with him and more comfortable with him, which helped me bond with him. So it was, yeah. it was a process at first. That was a huge thing for me. I was so glad because like I was Dr. Sleep, like literally all the time. But if he ever got so bad, I would just bring him to Jordan and it was all good. And I was like, thank God that he has this bond with her, even though like she's had this terrible experience. Yeah. I don't know what we would have done if that didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, that was a huge, that was a huge help to me. The last question was, how did you find a therapist? Finding a therapist is a lot of work. <laughs> like people are like, I tell people all the time, go to therapy, but it, it's, and I, I firmly stand behind that statement. And it's badass. No matter what your experiences have been in life. But it, it is a lot of work. Um, I did a lot of research. Um, I wanted somebody specifically that specialized in postpartum women. And because of that, my insurance didn't cover it and I had to pay out of pocket. And so I realized that not everybody has that ability. Um, therapy accessibility is a whole other, <laughs> an issue for another day. But healthcare in general, especially geared toward mental health is, yeah. The best way if you're looking for insurance to pay is to go through your insurance provider list, have them pull, like pull up all the therapists that are covered, um, whether sometimes you have to specify whether they're like licensed professional counselors or LCSWs, um, and just start going down that list and see who's, who's taking clients. That's probably the easiest way um if you can afford to pay someone out of pocket there are people who a lot of good good therapists don't deal with insurance because they've been doing it for a long time and they don't want to yeah um but the other thing is get on as many wait lists as you can if you're truly not being able to get into anybody like get on multiple people's wait lists because there's a chance that one of them is going to get back to you before another one and so if you're on multiple there's a good chance. Yeah. Um, well, the shitty part too is you do all this research and then you haven't met them at all. So you don't know if they're a great fit <laughs> even still. Yeah, yeah. So don't get discouraged. Yeah. There is a therapist out there that works for you. Oh, yeah. And not every like sometimes you might cycle through a few before you find one you like. And that's yeah. OK, because working with a therapist that you don't like isn't going to be effective. <clears throat> yep. So, yeah, there's my spiel on on therapy. Go to therapy. Go to therapy, everybody. Well, that sounds like a great place to wrap it up. So thanks. I've talked for a long time. Which is great. I'm glad that you were <laughs> able to. I didn't want. I was just over here comic relief kind of deal. But uh, yeah, thanks to everybody who um, has been asking about this because it's good to get it into a public sphere. But it's also good for, I think it's, it's good for you to talk about it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, like really go, getting into the nitty gritty of it, she doesn't share with a lot of people. Uh, but I think it's a beneficial experience for a lot of people to hear about. Yeah. Um, other than that, yeah, thanks for sticking around. This is a long this one. I'm looking at it raw and I'm like, oh, I'm not even going to cut it up. So this, this is pretty is much as long as it's going to get. <laughs> check out yeah our our other videos hit the subscribe button if you haven't hit the like button check out our instagram and our tiktok at jordan and mckay for both of those um our etsy store has awesome stickers and keychains we will be adding in the fall so keep an eye out for that we've got stuff in the works yes um if you'd like to support us in another way we have patreon accessible um access to exclusive bloopers and ad free versions of the same content and things like that but do you have anything else no any parting words well thank you everybody and we will see you next time